If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, go over to 1 Kings. 1 Kings and chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to work our way through the passage from verses 18 down through 36. This is a very familiar passage, so we'll give you time to, if you want to work with it in your Bible, take it, hold it. You know, uh, something that I find interesting, and that is, you know, how, how many people have your Bible on your cell phone? How many have a tablet? You know what? I'm, I'm one of the old guys. There's nothing like holding the book. There's nothing like holding the book. And what I find, you know, throughout the Scripture, time and time again, we find people had to guard against false gods. Even down, you find the apostles, the, the disciples of Jesus. One of the last phrases that you hear again and again and again is guard yourself. Guard yourself against false gods. And they were always running up against the challenge of false gods finding their way either into their culture or into their worship. When Israel finally fell, they had so incorporated all of the, the foreign gods and the foreign religions around them that they brought them right into the temple. And it actually became almost part of the temple worship. They thought, well, you know, we still have the temple, so we've still got the good stuff. We've still got the temple, so we've got God on our side. But from time to time, you find in the Scripture, the prophets would call out these foreign gods because they wanted the people to be familiar with who was truly God. They wanted them to see for themselves that how bankrupt religion could, could, could become, especially when all of these other things began to fall in. And no better example that you find in this than you find here in 1 Kings, especially with the prophet Elijah. Elijah, when he calls out the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, he calls them to a, to a showdown on Mount Carmel. Some people say, well, what's, what's so great about Mount Carmel? Well, at one time, you find that there was an altar to the living God that was built on Mount Carmel. It was a place of retreat. It was a place of worship. But he invites these prophets to a showdown on Mount Carmel because he wanted to prove who was really the living God. They could see for themselves and they could come to a point of decision. A point of decision which, who were they going to serve? But here's the question, who's this Elijah guy? Who is Elijah? Well, sometimes in the prophets we get this image in our head that these prophets were some superhuman type person. Well, James puts it very, very clear to us. He says it this way in James chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. He says, Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain. And the earth produced its crops. Well, the prophets were ordinary people. They were ordinary people who were called of God, but they had a very good understanding of covenant. The covenant that was made between the children of Israel and God. At the time when the children of Israel were coming into the promised land. If you want to do a good Bible study sometime, take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 29 because this is where you find the details, you might say. The details of what covenant is and what covenant does, the relationship that is there between God and his people. What you find in there is what we call the curses and the blessings. 
the blessings and the curses. Some people would say it's kind of like uh, in computer language, it's an if-then statement. If you do this, then you have this. Well, you find down in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verses 1 and 1 through 2, Moses talking to the people, he says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You can have all of these blessings. These blessings are all yours if you obey. If you obey. But then you get down to verse 15 and he goes to the other side. This is where you find the transition. However, it's kind of like, you know, remember mom? However, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God and you do not carefully follow all his commands and the decrees that I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. What I want you to get a hold of here is what he says here. All of these curses will come upon you. And then he adds this onto it and will overtake you. In other, way, other words, there is no way to get away from it. They will find you wherever you are. They will find you. The prophets understood the covenant. They understood the promises. But they understood that it was not just about following rules. It was about building a relationship. A relationship between God and His people. The relationship between the God of heaven, Yahweh, and the children of Israel. As we come to the passage that we we're working with here today, you find that Israel had abandoned their dependence on God. And they become to, they've come to rely on the pagan gods of Baal and Asherah. Baal was in the land when they moved into the promised land. God said, go in and get rid of all of this stuff. And they didn't. They compromised. They didn't get rid of everything that was there. And then later on, you find Jezebel. Jezebel comes into the picture, and she brings along Asherah, the god of fertility. So who was Baals? Who, you know, he says, you followed the Baals, plural. Well, the Baals were not just the god of fertility, but the god of weather, of rain, of wind, of lightning, of seasons. And these all brought into the expression, they were all dependent upon the sun. They were all dependent upon the sun. And the narrative that we find here actually begins back in verse 1 of the chapter. Things have become so bad that God comes to Elijah and says, you need to go to the king and tell him it's not going to rain. Well, okay, it's not going to rain. We know what it's like to not have rain. But for three and a half years, three and a half years, it's not going to rain. And it doesn't. It doesn't rain. And so by the time that we get down to verse 16, things are getting really, really dry. Everything is dying. And what the king has done, he has said we need, to, he sends his, his, uh, his servant Obadiah, he says, Go out and see if you can find some place around, maybe find a spring somewhere where we can take the horses. And we don't have to start killing off the horses because there's not enough water. So, Obadiah's out. He says, by the way, while you're out there, if by chance you find Elijah, let me know. By this time, the queen, Jezebel, is so upset with everything that's going on, she is looking for the prophets of God. And she's killing them off one by one while, while Ahab is on a manhunt looking for Elijah. Elijah runs on to the servant, Obadiah. And they said, it's time to get together. So go tell the king that I want to see him. It's time. 
it's time. So they arrange, they work together, and they get a time put together where Ahab, the king, and Elijah can get their heads together and maybe kind of figure this out. It's interesting to see what happens. They get together, and what happens is the first words out of the king's mouth is, is that you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah comes back and he says, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. You're the problem. He says, you have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. I'm not the problem. You're the problem. You need to remember that the children of Israel, when they moved into the land of Canaan, were a bunch of, were a bunch of nomads. They had been herding livestock out in the desert. They had no clue of what it meant to farm the ground. They had no idea what it meant to grow crops. And so what had happened? They had come to depend on the gods of the land. If you want to, hey, if you want a good crop, what are you going to do? Well, you find one of the gods that will help give you the advantage over what's going on because you want a good crop you don't want your family to starve to death and by the way while you're at it you might as well find one of the gods of fertility so that you can have a strong family too all of this had filtered its and worked its way into the lives and the culture of the children of Israel so Elijah throws down the gauntlet so to speak he makes the challenge he makes the challenge and what he says to the king is now Summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring 450, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. In other words, these were the guys who were on the local political payroll. They ate at the table of the queen. The people had come to tolerate the religions around them, it's what you call religious pluralism, if you want the big word. But basically, it's what it means is, if you want to worship your God, you go ahead. I won't say anything about it. You just go right ahead. It's a matter of political correctness. Political correctness, and uh, we, we, we don't want to cause trouble. And so you have a contest that begins to arise from the God of heaven, the true God, and the gods of the land. And so what you find down in, in verse 21, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver? How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Now the prophet begins to lay down the rules, you might say, or the parameters of what is going to be involved in all of this contest that takes place. Now when the prophet begins to lay it down, he does something very interesting. He actually gives the prophets of Baal and Asherah, he gives them the advantage and you say well how does that well here's how it goes he says this is going to be a test by fire a test by fire well Baal is the fire god Baal his worshipers honor the sun and the interesting thing about this contest is going to take place on top of a mountain at the hottest part of the day when everything is dry, and you might say anything could strike off a fire under the sacrifice, as dry it as it is, it won't take much to get a fire going. Well, okay. Well, he does something else. He brings on 850 of the prophets. So here's the odds. 850 to 1. 850 to 1, you know, if, there, if, if positive thinking has any, any, any force, 
if getting our minds together and thinking towards one thing has any possibilities, then you might say the well-intended prayers of the prophets could easily ignite the wood. But then there's another thing here. The image that you find used in Baal worship is a bull. And what does Elijah do? He selects the bulls to be sacrificed. But even more than that, he lets them choose which one they want to use first. So he gives them the best one and he takes the lesser. He takes the lesser one. Well, you might say the deck is stacked against the prophet. The deck is stacked against the prophet in such a way, and by the way, I'll throw this in. Baal in the local language means Lord. So, if Baal is Lord, if he answers with fire, then he must be Lord. And if he does not answer with fire, then he's not worthy to be called Lord. You know, this is a difficult thing. If warm bodies would guarantee a prayer meeting, 850 should do a pretty good job. Well, compared to this one poor preacher that's wandered in out of the wilderness, the king doesn't like him anyway. The queen despises him, and the prophets have all of the money. So who has the advantage? Who has the upper hand here? They could taste the victory. They knew it was theirs. They were so pumped up when they came to this time that you could almost smell the fire. You could almost smell the the bull roasting on the flames. What chance did this one poor preacher have in a contest like this? Well, this seems so silly. And so things started. Things got going. You find down in verse 26, so they took the bull given them and they prepared it. Then they began to call on the name of Baal from morning until noon. You think our services are long. From morning until noon. Morning happened to be about two hours after the sun was up. So what time did the sun come up this morning? Well, this don't go there. So anyway, here they are. They took the bull that had been given them, they prepared it, and they began to call on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Oh, Baal, oh, Baal, hear us. They shouted, but there was no response. There was no response. No one answered. And so they began to dance around the altar that they had made. You know, if sincerity had any way of, of, of shaping things, you could say that these 850 prophets prayed like their lives depended on it. And it did. They prayed as if it would have been their last day and it probably was, the way thing the story goes. You know, they begin to pour out their hearts. So they took the bull that had been given them, they prepared it. They called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they made at noon. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he says. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. And the interesting part about this, don't just take the word busy and kind of brush it aside. The Hebrew meaning of this word busy is maybe he's out relieving himself. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping or, and he must be awakened. So they shouted louder. They slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until the blood flowed. We're not talking about a little drip here and a little drip there. We're talking about running. 
This is getting messy now. Midday passed. They continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. They prayed from morning until noon, not just with meager results, with no results, with no results. And Elijah, they begin to wonder, why have the gods not answered? Elijah is not being disrespectful here because he's not disrespecting a deity because they weren't deities. This was all he was trying to do was show them how bankrupt their religion is, how futile it is. The scripture says that midday, midday passes and they continue to their, prof their prophesying and it came to the time of the evening sacrifice and there was no response. No response. There is silence on Mount Carmel. The last amen has been said by the priest. They stop. They open their eyes. No fire. The bull is still there. There's no heat under the bull. They did everything that they were supposed to do. Go back through the checklist and let's think this thing out. You know, how could this be? The test is to be by fire. It's to be by fire and Baal is the fire god. Well, the test took place in the heat of the day when the sun, excuse me, should have lit the sacrifice without any, 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 any problem at all. Everything is extremely dry. Remember, there hasn't been rain for three and a half years. Baal, Baal worship, part of the worship was around the bull. And it wasn't just any bull. This was the best one. This was the best one. And now, well, Baal means Lord and he's Lord, right? Well, so what do you have with the odds? 850 to 1. 850 to 1. And not only with that, they had, I mean, they had all of the political power. They had all the money. They had all of the support. What, what, what else did they need? But where was the fire? Why did they fail? Baal had done nothing. He'd done nothing. You know, if this had been the Olympic Games, they would have had 10 straight zeros. 10 straight zeros would have been scored. I like, like what it says then. Then Elijah calls the people. He says, come here. He says, come here. Come to me. What I find interesting about this phrase, he doesn't stand there and go, I told you so. He doesn't stand there and shake his finger at them and go, for shame, for shame, for shame. Shame on you. No. Now it's Yahweh's turn. It's Yahweh's turn because everything now is not focused on Elijah. It's focused on God. He didn't want to impress the people with who he was. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to have their eyes focused on him. He wanted to restore them to a relationship with the living God. And so we find down in verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come to me. And they came to him. And then he begins to work this thing out. It says, he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the Lord, the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. 
he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to us. A sea of seed is about 13 quarts. So if you do the math, it'll hold six and a half gallons of water. He arranged the wood. He cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Then he says, do it again. And so they did it again. And he says a third time, and they did it a third time until the water ran down around the altar and filled the trench. Now, it seems like Elijah has done some really silly things. Number one, he takes a less desirable bull to be sacrificed. And then what's he do? He takes a ruined, run-down altar that had fell into bad repair because it hadn't been used in such a long time. And then what's he do? He orders them to do something that makes no sense at all. He says, wet it down. Wet it down. He doesn't say wet it down once. He wet it down three times. Now remember where this is all taking place. This is taking place on top of a mountain where there hasn't been any rain for three and a half years. So they probably, the mountain, if you look on a map, is not that far from the sea. So they may have run down to the sea and got the water. They may have had the water there because this is a huge amount of people. And I'm sure that throughout the day, probably some people were getting thirsty. But he doesn't say wet it down once. He says wet it down again and then wet it down again until the water had so saturated the sacrifice and saturated the wood and saturated the altar until it filled the trench around it as well. Now, something you need to remember in all of this muddy mess. 850 prophets had shouted and cut themselves and and made all of this ruckus from early morning until the time of sacrifice, which is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the prophet of God walks to the altar and he says a prayer that's two sentences long. Now talk about simple prayer. Two sentences. Two sentences. And the scripture says at the time of sacrifice, the prophet stepped forward and he prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant and have done all of these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Swift, short, to the point. And now it's Yahweh's turn. And boy, did he respond. He responds and it says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. Now, it's one thing, you know, hey, all he asked for was that they burn up the sacrifice. So it would have been enough to have just lit the fire and burn up the sacrifice. But God disintegrated it all. I can imagine nothing left but a big black crater. That's all that was left. It was all gone. The bull, the wood, the altar, even down to the water in the trench, it was all gone. Now we've given attention in this passage 
to all of the main characters, 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. We've given our attention to Elijah. And we've given our attention to Yahweh. But who is all of this for? It's for the people of Israel. It's for the children of Israel who had gathered there that day. It's not for the priests. It's not for Elijah. It's not even for the king. And he was there too. It's for the children of Israel because he wanted them to make a decision. If you go back to verse 21 of this passage, it's interesting. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And then he says, But the people said nothing. The people said nothing. Up to this point, they had responded to the religious pluralism in the land as they had been taught to respond with open tolerance. Open tolerance to all the religions. They were taught not to call anything true or false. The people said nothing. What a powerful statement. They didn't want to get involved in any religious debates. They didn't want to be pointing fingers at anybody. They didn't want to put any faiths to the test. They just kind of wanted things to go away, so to speak. Does this sound familiar? I hope so. Because this is exactly where our culture is. Our culture urges us not to respond to the religious pluralism of our day. We are urged to be tolerant. Be tolerant of all religions. To say nothing. We're not to say that our religion is true and your religion is not. We are urged to say, eh, all of the religions are going to get you to heaven someday, so just let it go. But Elijah reminds us that the God who answers with fire is the true God. He reminds us that just like the Hebrew people in this passage, we can let the religions around us so influence us that it comes into our lives and, you know, it can even come into our worship. John Wesley's mother, Susanna Wesley, said, anything that comes between us and God is sin. In other words, don't be afraid to call sin, sin. We constantly, though, have to be aware of the possibility of sin. We cannot be so bold as to say, that could never happen to me. Because sure as shooting, if we fix our minds on that and we say, that won't happen to me, what do we see happening? It happens to me. I can say, I hope not. I can say, I'll do everything that I can to prevent it. But I can never be so bold as to say, it won't. Because sure shooting probably will. The Hebrew people saw Yahweh answer Elijah that day. A simple two-sentence prayer. And the scripture says, Then all of the people, when all of the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have a cross. You know, I would hope that our response today, 
our response in this church age that we find ourselves in is Jesus is Lord. It's not a matter of being a good guy. It's not a matter of getting all of the rules right. It's a matter of who is Lord of your life? Who is Lord of your life? If it's the Baals, follow them. But if it's Yahweh, follow him. In other words, you can't have your feet in both camps. You can't straddle the fence. It just won't work. Lord God, help us. Now, please understand, I don't want anybody to go out looking for a fight. I don't want anybody to go out and try and pick a, a fight with your neighbor who may have a different faith than you do. But what we find, the writer to the Hebrews saying in chapter 12 and verse 14, he says, live in peace. Live in peace with those around you. But be holy. Be holy means that we're not like the culture. We're set apart. We're set apart for a greater purpose. And he goes on and says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Holiness, sometimes that's a big word for us. Basically what it means is living like Jesus. Living like Jesus. And I don't believe that God expects us to go out and beat up on everybody. But I do believe that he expects us to live our lives in such a way, number one, that people see a difference. Number two, that it gives him glory. God bless you all. You are sent.